Okay, where do we go from here? Uh, we have a, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm talking to my director at the same time. Let me, uh, let me put this, uh, this fax question out to the panel. What kind of innovative supervision techniques are officers using to uncover gang activities, clubs, and associations of offenders on supervision? Surveillance? Absolutely. Surveillance. Uh, something I don't know if we've really touched upon it today is your law enforcement sources in the community. I mean, you really have to rely on them, what's going on in each of the communities. Uh, we have a, an expert in Jersey City that we use quite often, um, just for identification purposes, if nothing else. And he's identified clubs, hangouts, businesses, you name it, that are definitely uh, related to Asian gang members okay. uh, in one way or another. And we've used that individual or had him on call. Uh, for association type uh, violations in court uh, as an expert witness. Okay. I, I can't Please. emphasize that enough. Network, network, network. There are so many groups out there and, and you know you can't be an expert on every one of them. But somewhere out there there is somebody who knows something about them. So it's just a, the matter of networking and, and finding out where these sources are and using broad based sources for your information. And you know a point Victor's made to me before and it's always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. is you, you really need to weed through those sources just because someone went to a uh, a gang seminar for a day or two doesn't make him or her an expert <laughs> That's right. on the gangs. That reminds me, I was in law enforcement, that the, the, the common thing was you go to a tr special training seminar for a week, you come back now, all of a sudden you're right. the expert right. in right. the field, you know. That's a good point to make. We've got a caller from New York. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Yes. What's your question? Okay, are there any available list of known members or associates of gangs? This, pro this list would serve the releasee as a list of official notice of persons with whom he may not associate. Okay. Do you want to, Rachel, do you want to jump in there? I'm not sure um, whether your local law enforcement has it. I know our local law enforcement in Atlanta has a um, gang computer system where they enter this data and they can pull up the gang that you're talking about, um, give you names and, and generally pictures of everybody that's that uh, they have associated with that gang. I don't know that there is specifically like a nationwide network where you could just, you know, put in a, a gang name and it would, it would tell you everybody that was in the gang, but definitely I would start with your local law enforcement in the community where that gang appears most active or where your defendant lives. You can talk to SIU. They get the, uh, if there was a list of separate co defendant lists. Uh, from the institutions, you know, mm -hmm. make it known to that individual when he's released, say, look, you can't associate with these people once uh, you're released. They've been identified as gang members relative okay. to your activity. New York, I appreciate your call. I know, I, and I saw the facts with the same question, so thanks for taking the time. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I know we've got a caller on hold, but I've got a facts question uh, from the Southern District of Texas, and it looks like we'll, we'll uh, uh, go to Dale and Craig to see what uh, we can pick their brains about here. Um, Craig, probably going to you here. What percentage of gangs within the BOP system is made up of organized foreign gangs, Nigerian, Colombian, Asian, et cetera? Well, I'm not sure I could give you the actual percentage off the top of my head, but I can, I can definitely confirm that we have everything from Israeli mafia to Russian mafia to Nigerian organized crime uh, to various organized crime groups out of the Caribbean, uh, various Jamaican posse groups out of, and also out of the uh, Dominican Republic and all that. So we certainly have a, a sizable representation. Uh, that's also true of uh, Southeast Asia. I think we already talked about several of the uh, very specific groups, um, you know, Ghost Shadows, Born to Kill, things like that. So I, from the top of my head, I, I'm not sure if I could give you a percentage, uh, but it would be uh, a significant representation. And uh, just a general comment about Bureau of Prisons that isn't often known and understood. Uh, one out of every four inmates, or 25 percent of our population, are foreign nationals. So we're, we are going to have foreign representation uh, in, in our various gangs. Good point. Let me, uh, we have a second question on this fax, and it looks like it might, might go back to our officers here. Again, an issue with female gangs. Are they on the increase, obviously based on your experience, and here's, here's kind of an interesting twist. Are they more dangerous uh, because, I guess, the thinking is because they are female gangs, they need to prove themselves? So first part of it, are, do you think they're on the increase? And again, you just use your I, I couldn't experience. specifically tell you if, if they're 
on the increase, but I can tell you that they can be more dangerous to rival gang members because they can lull them. I think there's been some incidents, and I think it's, it was in Minneapolis, maybe. Uh, Minnesota, and when you say somewhere. rival gang members, you just mean you mean male gang members? Right, they use them to set them up. They'll use okay. the, the, the female uh, gang members to lure the rival gang members to a particular place where, where they'll be killed. Or in this instance, I believe they did the killing themselves. Okay. So and this is, is this the auxiliary situation you were talking about before? Where in this they, case, right. one gang is using part of their, their female uh, right. offenders. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else seen an increase in female gangs in their I, I can't say for sure we have or haven't. Okay. Do you have them that, that you know? I, I would say, uh, as Dale or Craig said earlier, with the, uh, the Latin Kings, you can definitely say it with them, and we're seeing more and more of that in New Jersey now. Okay. Okay, our call from Phoenix. Thank you for holding. Uh, what's your question? Hi, Mark. This is, this is Pam Sider from Phoenix, and I actually have a two-part question. The first part for Craig and Dale is, um, what steps has the BOP taken with ISU to gather information on juvenile gang members? Okay. Um, I ask this because specifically in Tucson, we have a lot of juvenile gang offenders convicted under federal law for gun offenses. Well, ordinarily, the Federal Bureau of Prisons is not going to have juvenile offenders in custody. There's been a few exceptions, uh, most notably down in Guanabo, Puerto Rico, uh, where we did accept some juvenile offenders in a very narrow program down there. We're talking three, four, five inmates at a time. But ordinarily, the federal prison system does not have uh, juvenile offenders. But because many of the gang structures have a, a whole range of, of demographics where they have uh, tiny gangsters and, and all the way up through original gangsters and whatever, uh, certainly the information that we gather might be valid for uh, some of the younger members of the gang. Uh, we may, uh, along the way, learn about uh, younger uh, crips or younger members of uh, other uh, gang organizations. So we don't directly collect on on uh, juvenile gangs, but still our holdings might include information that might refer to activities by uh, uh, juvenile members of gangs. Okay. Phoenix, is that the first part of your question? Does that take care of that? Yes, it does. Okay, what's um, the, the second, second part? The second part goes right to Victor. Um, we want to know if he has any ideas how to network better with the south Southwestern dis District. The Southwestern District? Yeah. Because a lot of us share similar gang information between Texas, uh, California, and Arizona. Is there any kind of ideas you have how these officers could better network our intelligence information? Well, first of all, check around to see what gang uh, investigators associations are around. For example, in Texas, we have the Texas uh, Gang Investigators Association, and, and many of our officers that are, that are on our high-risk unit belong to this association. So that gives a kind of a panoramic view of what's going on across the state. Uh, one of the things that we really need to do is we need to get our special offender specialists kind of to talk to each other, uh, especially on a regional basis. Uh, for example, uh, in our El Paso division, there's some pretty specific gang issues there that are probably more pertinent to New Mexico and Arizona than they are to us in San Antonio. But we do need to really have more dialogue on a regional basis. Thank you. That does answer the question. Because in, in New Jersey, we should be having regular contact with eastern and southern uh, New York all the time, our special offender specialists, and down into Philadelphia with our Camden officer, uh, who I think does a, a real good job of, of communicating with them. I think in the northern part, we have to do a better job of that. Okay. Phoenix, I think I, I lost you, but again, thank you for your two-part question. Appreciate it. Um, Craig, I've got, I've got a, a fax that came in from Sacramento that's uh, several questions. I can't promise we'll get to all of them, but let me run a few of them by you. In the process of transferring an inmate from the institution to a halfway house, how does the SIS play a part in reviewing the CCC referral? Well, I think it would uh, have a lot to do with uh, w whether the inmate was a member of a security threat group or not. If he was just a member of the general population and, f and functioning uh, normally, uh, programming normally, uh, the SIS may not play a major role. On the other hand, if he's a member of a security threat group or in the extreme a validated member of a disruptive group, then there'd be a great deal of intelligence that would be available. So as they prefer the, uh, prepare the transfer package, uh, the SIS often would uh, uh, contribute uh, various information about the various incidents the inmate might have been involved in, various threat characteristics. Sometimes there might even be some officer safety issues. So if he specifically was STG or in the extreme case a member of a certified disruptive group, uh, then certainly the local case manager at the institution uh, would have that information 
ordinarily available to them as they prefer, uh, prepared a, a transfer package, whether it was to a halfway house, another institution, or, or whatever the case may be. Okay, let me, let me follow up with, with an additional from this fax, and then we're going to go to our, our caller from Los Angeles. Uh, Craig, how can the information that the SIS at the facility reach the CCM to assist in placing an inmate at a CCC? There's a lot of acronyms in there. I know you understand what they mean. Well, one of the uh, issues uh, might be uh, in terms of what's available to the uh, CCM via Sentry. And again, I'm using jargon that's very specific to our agency. Sentry is our online computer system that we use to identify inmates, uh, current location, and whatever. There's a facility on Sentry called uh, Security Threat Group uh, Selection Category, STG Category. And among the other things a CCM can do is request access to that STG category on Sentry, which would show them uh, members, suspects, associates, and whatever, and would have some intelligence uh, available to them that way. Uh, in addition, the transfer package should have information attached to it. Uh, if they look at an inmate and, and realize that he's a member, a suspect, an associate of a group, and they didn't receive uh, as much information as they might have uh, anticipated, they could certainly call the SIS at the institution or, as we've stressed uh, on a number of other issues, uh, work through SIU, because SIU is going to have a good uh, 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 thumbnail sketch of the inmate in terms of his uh, gang activity, his associates, the threats he might pose, whatever. So uh, either one or both uh, would uh, be very responsive to what the CCM might need. Okay, thanks for that, Craig. Uh, we've got a caller who's been on hold from Los Angeles. Thanks for your patience. Hello? Hello. Hi, what's your question? Uh, this is Lee Aubrey, Central District, California, and uh, uh, first of all, I'd just like to say I appreciate this conference because I think uh, uh, the gang situation will be a, a matter of going concern on the federal system. And uh, what I have done in, uh, on a monthly basis, I attend uh, meetings uh, with a number of uh, different law enforcement agencies, uh, state and local where we discuss uh, gangs and have speakers and all. And what I find is uh, that there's some pretty scary things uh, coming out of those meetings. Mm -hmm. For example, um, learn that whereas we uh, validate gangs or gang members and have them uh, maybe computerized, found that the gangs themselves also have law enforcement personnel uh, in their computer system and have them identified uh, as gang suppression type law enforcement officers. And uh, some of them are very worried uh, due to the fact that there has been some contracts, uh, according to them, put out on some of these officers. So my question is, uh, do you find any of this thus far as uh, you know, probation officers, any problems in that area, or do you think there will be? And if so, uh, would there be anything we can do about it? Okay, quest, uh, let's go to that. Well, just generally be aware that, they, that some gangs, some groups do, do counterintelligence. Don't. Just have an awareness that that could happen. Yeah. To just and when you say counterintelligence, that, again, just let's sort of... Uh, what well, they sometimes call doing right. a CIA, uh, that means maybe following you home or, or checking you mm -hmm. out a little bit. So the, as, as, we, as, as officers are doing intelligence on these folks, these gang members are also right. checking out. Right. What the kind of officers. vehicles do you drive? What are the GSA cars? Which are the GSA cars? Those mm -hmm. kind of things. And don't don't slip up in general conversation with these people either. I mean, don't talk about your family. It's not their business. That's not what they're there for. Right. Mm -hmm. Take the pictures down of the wife and the and the kids. Okay. All right. I've just been told that that uh, through the good graces of the satellite company, we have now till three thirty to get the rest. Of the, hopefully, the rest of these questions. So. If you're waiting to get online to, for a live call-in, uh, again, please take advantage of it. We're still with you, and we still have a few more facts questions that we want to get to as well. Okay, um, facts question again. Do they believe, uh, they meaning all of you guys here, that gang members are being actively recruited while in custody? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Ah, a nod of, uh, of not affirmation only, all the way around. Not only are they being recruited in custody, they're being recruited on the streets all the time. Uh, it's a never-ending process, but it's a two-way street, too. Not only are gangs recruiting new prospects, new prospects are looking at gangs. They're looking at gangs for various reasons, for lack of family ties or what have you, but it's a two-way street. 
that's why they're called prison gangs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are, they, most prison gangs, there's a pattern that, that they start in prison and eventually they transition into the community. Sure. But they're yeah. generally prison spawned gangs. All right. Okay. All right, we've got a caller from Kansas City. Hello, Kansas City. <laughs> you there? Hello. Hello, Kansas City. How, how are you? Great. Good. Welcome. Okay, my question is that uh, have you noticed any predictable patterns of retaliation by the gang's members or gang families to the PSOs, USPOs, or the courts, and recognizing their counterintelligence for propensity for violence? Do they entertain behavior like liens on personal property, anything of that type? Okay, anybody here? Do you want to? Speak I of specific examples. Uh, I, I can only speak of one incident. I'm really not going to elaborate too much. Where a particular yeah. prison gang, uh, and it was a prison gang member, uh, made some threats and actually came into the, the federal courthouse in San Antonio with a weapon. Okay. okay. Craig, Dale, any comments <coughs> on that question? <coughs> yes, the, uh, we've had experiences with the militia type, white supremacists. Uh, we'll put uh, common law liens on. Um, uh, you know, on, on not probation officers, but on uh, different people. Uh, so yes, they do. They do do that. And that, like Victor was saying, the C, this, uh, you know, CIA investigations and, and backgrounds and that type of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, we just got a fax in. And by the way, th Kansas City, does that answer your phone call? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get back to you. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Los, Los Angeles, I apologize for not making sure that we we clarified or, or put closure to your question. I hope we did. Um, I got a fax from uh, Reuben Mason in, in Texas Southern, and there's a little note I'll share with folks. Could you please answer our question? We have a large crowd patiently waiting. <laughs> so here we go. We often include brief paragraphs that a defendant's siblings, uh, immediate family, has a prior record in the PSI. Should we do the same if a defendant's sibling is in a gang, even though the defendant is not? This, of course, is if the ID has been validated that the sibling is in a gang. I hope I read that correctly, Texas Southern. That's, that's a matter of, of district, you know, what your district wants to do. Uh, my main concern would be that the information be available for the officer that is going to supervise the case when the offender eventually gets out to the community. Uh, again, you're talking about officer safety uh, sure. issues. Sure. Yeah. If it's stricken from the, the pre-sentence report, if you do try to include it, Make a brief chrono. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And get some communication between the two units. Okay. Texas Southern, I hope we got to it okay. I hope you're happy with the answer and that there's a sigh of relief all around down there. We've got a caller. We're going back to Richmond. Hello, Richmond. Richmond, you there? Uh, actually, this is from Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Okay. Well, that's not too close to Richmond, is it? Uh, thank you. I have uh, two quick comments. And one question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, comment on officer, <laughs> officer safety. Uh, first of all, I would encourage all the participants not to be afraid to ask who resides in the house. Is your brother, your sister on probation? Uh, get IDs and so on, and uh, really find out who's there before doing a home visit. Now, the second comment is on risk control. Uh, many of gang members have not been identified in the past. <laughs> and have uh, asked for a lot of travel permits across the country. Take the extra step, find out why they're traveling, who they're going with, and so on. That's really, really important because there's a lot of probation officers that are supervising uh, special offenders without really knowing it. And the question for the presenters is uh, what, what size or are you dealing with gangs that are Native American gangs? That's the question. Good question. Thanks, Las Vegas. Hold on. Native American gangs? We have no experience with Native American None gangs in, in, uh, in my district. None in New Jersey. No. Yeah. Nope. Can't see Let's, uh, let me go to Craig and Dale and uh, Native American gangs, Native guys. American. Well, a comment I would make in the, in the Bureau of Prisons, uh, when we're asked about Native American gangs, I think people are anticipating us coming up with some kind of uh, Indian word or Indian term describing a gang. What we actually have among our Native Americans in custody are members of the Black Anxious Disciples, the Crips, the Bloods, 
uh, the Latin Kings, the other gangs that you see. Uh, so yes, we definitely have Indian members of gangs, but frequently they're emulating or copying uh, other gangs out in the community. Uh, and sometimes successfully, where, for instance, a Crip faction or whatever might be very similar to a Crip faction you might find elsewhere, sometimes they'll be in name only and be very unique to the reservation. But there's been re relatively few gangs that we've experienced that were truly unique uh, to the Native American culture. Uh, now, we have had special interest groups, American Indian Movement and groups like that, uh, that I would not classify as a gang. Uh, but ordinarily, we see... Uh, uh, gangs that look very much like you'd expect to see in Chicago or Los Angeles or whatever, but operating on the gang on the in Indian reservation with the same name and some of the same characteristics. So yes, we definitely see Indian gang members in custody. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Las Vegas, for your phone call. Um, another fax question coming from Chicago. Uh, Craig, this will probably go to you. Would BOP send the completed validation form to the supervising PO? I think uh, we'd have to look at that. We'd probably uh, abstract from it, provide all the information. We consider the form itself sensitive. I think what we'd like to do is talk with the supervising uh, 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 individual out in the community and go over their spe special needs and go over everything on it, what they might need, and send them elements of intelligence from it. Uh, my instincts are that we may want to protect the form itself because of some sensitivities, but sh uh, do a lot of sharing of the various uh, individual elements and in some cases the intelligence that supports it. So maybe not a, a fax or a Xerox copy as such, but uh, significant portions uh, of the intelligence that would be useful to them. Okay. Um, second question on this fax, and this is, does the FJC or the BOP know of websites for different gangs? Um, let me just jump in. I've done just a, a basic, uh, like a Yahoo or a Lycos search on the internet uh, when we first started researching this and was able just to start finding listings of these folks. Uh, Craig, do you guys keep uh, list of these websites as well? Well, the one thing I think that you need to understand about uh, the internet when you're looking at websites, the thing that amazes me how quickly the sites come and go uh, where I might get on there <laughs> and be fascinated by a website for Larry Hoover and the Black Anchor Disciples and then uh, go back a few days later or a week when I have more time to spend uh, some time looking at it and find that uh, the particular site might not be there anymore. But yes, we can definitely confir uh, confirm that uh, uh, Black Anxious, for instance, have had websites. I believe I've seen some Latin King uh, websites. Uh, I've seen uh, very specific information about the various gangs. And on occasion, when you get into uh, some of the other groups, uh, you might find uh, opposing groups uh, having information on there about uh, a gang where they are providing information about it, but uh, definitely see uh, a more and more activity on the Internet uh, regarding the gangs. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we've got a caller patiently waiting from Pittsburgh. Hello. Hi. I have a question as to whether or not any type of evaluation is being done on supervising gang members once they are re eventually released from the prison system. As you know, we're putting quite a number of these people away for very long periods of time, and we're curious as to whether this issue has been looked at. Good question. Uh, I don't know if anybody here would, would be in a position. Craig, Dale, anything on that? There are some academic studies <clears throat> that have been done as far as uh, you know, gang members that are released. I don't know anything, anything specific. Uh, I think University of Chicago, George Knox, uh, right. has done some work. Um, I'm trying to think, that, uh, Russ Curry. There's several uh, from the academic side, and that, that's where I would look for that information. Also, uh, through NIJ, uh, National Institute of Justice, uh, the research center, you may find something there. I'm just not familiar with the documents. Mm -hmm. okay. Pittsburgh, does that help at least? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Uh, let's get to a fax, and then we've got Cincinnati uh, waiting in the wings. What is the success, the success rate? <laughs> getting a little punchy here, guys. What is the success rate of gang members being rehabilitated, and are there any community-based organizations that help gang members in their rehabilitation? So I, we, we talked about the success rate earlier when we got into the treatment issues, and there was sort of a resounding or collective uh, no, we really don't have a lot of success treating these folks. Uh, how, about, how about the organizations? I don't have any statistics about the success rate. I wouldn't think there'd be any 
higher success rate than uh, with our ordinary caseload, probably lower success rate. Sure. I don't know of any organizations in Nebraska that particularly deal with helping gangsters get out of gangs. They probably do exist some of maybe uh, some of the larger cities. Victor? Victor. Well, Very generally, general. we don't, uh, those type of programs do exist in our community. And sure. Generally, they're geared toward the, the, the youthful offenders right. and, and the street right. gangs. So as federal officers, we rarely have, have contact with those. Okay. Um, not Rachel, were you going to say something? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Well, I, w I was just going to mention, we also have to clarify a little bit about, uh, you know, the success rate. Um, for, I think, a lot of us, somebody actually making it through the term of supervision without being revoked is considered success. And, uh, <laughs> you know, whether that's a total rehabilitative success story on the part of somebody coming out of a gang, being drug-free, crime-free for however many years, I don't know of of particular programs like that in the Atlanta area, um, but I have had a few people actually complete supervision without going back to prison. They just put it on hold for a little while. That's yeah. all. Craig yeah. Dale, any awareness there on organizations that may be uh, set up to help gang members? I think there might be some uh, uh, help available through the academic community. I think uh, uh, Dale already mentioned George Knox and uh, associates there at uh, it was the University of Illinois at Chicago, I believe, mm -hmm. is, is, is his organization. Uh, I think they may be aware of uh, some specific resources, uh, but again, we're more on the enforcement side rather than the treatment side, so we could assist with finding such organizations, but we, we aren't uh, directly connected to them. Another one I, w I would suggest uh, would be to contact ACA, American Correctional Association. Sure. Uh, they have publications and documents, and, and they probably could help you there also. And again, NIJ and uh, uh, those organizations, Department of Justice, might have some information be very helpful. Thank you very much for that. And I believe we still have Cincinnati online. Is that correct? That's correct. Hi, Cincinnati. Thanks for being patient. What's your question? Yes, because of confidentiality concerns, to what extent can we provide information to the local intel intelligence community about gang activity of our offenders? Okay, good question. Hold on. And these guys are pointing to one another. Tom? <laughs> I don't know if confidentiality comes in as much in this type of uh, situation as it does in a, you know, a drug abuser or you know, somebody with mental health problems. You know, if you've identified someone as a, as a gang member, there's a certain risk, a definite risk to the community. And as we've all said before in previous discussions, if you want to cultivate these law enforcement sources and you want information from them, you better be prepared to give some information to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, it starts right there. If you've identified someone as a, as a member of a gang or a threat group, give that information up. I really don't think that's as much a confidential confidentiality issue. What are your no. thoughts on that? Go ahead, Richard. I think that, that something else that, that we have already established a basis uh, as far as disclosure of this to the police uh, and the community is the uh, law enforcement address notifications that we are now required by right. law. Exactly. And the vast majority of your uh, gang members are going to fall under that Violent Crime Act, either through drugs or guns Good point. Uh, Good or point. that history in their past. <laughs> so you already have the opportunity to provide this information to your local law enforcement and to any law enforcement agency you deem needs to have that information. Okay. I think it's Good, we deal with so few juveniles, confidentiality is just not really a concern right. with us. In the case of a juvenile, it would be a concern, but uh, in the federal system, we just have very, very few of them. So I think it's yeah. more important to share the information with the local law enforcement agency. Being mindful that we don't put this on the bulletin board in the, in the restroom somewhere. <laughs> it's shared with other law enforcement agencies who also keep confidence the information we give them. Sure. Maybe, maybe give them a, a summary memo, mm -hmm. uh, summarizing the case and what the person's all about and put on there, you know, this is for law enforcement and intelligence purposes only. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, I've got one more facts question, and I don't know that we have anybody else calling in at this point, so here we go. Are ongoing gang wars in this, uh, the same in different parts of the country? In Nebraska, we don't have ongoing ga gang wars. They more or less start and finish, but on different, uh, for different reasons. I don't think there's one war that goes, goes on for two or three years, but something may happen in one instance that causes gang war to start, that may die out, then something else happens, and causes, then that dies out after a while. I don't know if there's an ongoing gang war. I know different gangs have feuds going on, um, but as an ongoing gang war, I don't believe that's happening in Nebraska. Okay. But, but do the same 
like if Gang 1 is feuding with Gang 2 in Omaha, are those two gangs automatically feuding in New York? may no. not be so. I may not think be so, so at all. It may, it may be a regional feud that doesn't bring in everybody that's right. on this side or that right. side. Craig, I see you nodding your head. Uh, mm -hmm. Thought on that? I, I agree totally. Uh, in our long-term experience within the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, we've seen situations, and I'll, I'll go back to Texas again, where we saw the uh, Mexiconomy and the Texas Syndicate uh, for all practical purposes at war within the Texas Department of Corrections, but then we'd find within the Federal Bureau of Prisons the same two groups would basically say that's their uh, we're, we're doing fine here and, and they would get along fine for, for years. Uh, so we see more of a, um, a situation where there might be a problem start in one state or one jurisdiction, one part of the country. It might eventually move to affect other parts of the country. But so far, uh, when we've seen a local situation, say, between Latin Kings and Los Salidos in Massachusetts, we don't necessarily see a problem between Latin Kings and Los Salidos in the federal system or say down in Florida. It's, it's pretty local and pretty regional. But I'd also indicate that you need to be very aware of that feuding and that, uh, the, those issues going in other parts of the country because they could affect you in the future. But I think the, uh, the macro answer is not necessarily. A problem in one city or one part of a city may not necessarily uh, be uh, uh, occurring at the same time in, uh, throughout the gang in other cities, other states. I think we've exhausted our questions. I think we've exhausted our time. And I think we've exhausted our panelists. <laughs> so at that point, let me say this. Let me again thank our guests. And most importantly, let me thank you, our audience, for watching and participating in this program. We really hope that you found today's presentations informative and that the information will be useful in your management and supervision of defendants and offenders who are gang members. Please be on the lookout also for future announcements of upcoming programs in the Federal Judicial Center's Special Needs Offenders Series. And with that, I thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>